So that was over. That took place. It was over. That was over, and General Douglas MacArthur had already been fired. But you talk about treason. You know, when I when I came back home, uh, uh, when I came back home from the Korean War, <coughs> I was pretty, I was very nervous and kind of fouled up. And I, I discovered uh, I didn't know then. I found it. The, I was to find out years later. I became an alcoholic. And uh, my first wife, she had a hard time coping with me. I had a mother-in-law didn't like me. She moved in with her mother when uh, I left for Korea, and at one occasion I kicked her bedroom door in. I was going to kill the mother-in-law, you know, because my nerves were, I was a sick combat veteran. Well, you had this uh, delayed, delayed stress. Syndrome, they, yeah. they didn't recognize that back then, and they don't really oh, like to recognize uh -huh. it now, do right. they? Right, no, they don't. And, you know, you think that someone would have did something then, you know. This was right after my return from Korea, and uh, I didn't know about going to a VA hospital. They never told us. I went to a private doctor because I couldn't have a bowel movement, and the doctor, you know, took put the glove on like they do, and he said, my God, he said, your sphincter muscle is locked. He said, are you a Korean War vet? And I said, yes, doctor, I am. He said, are, what kind of conditions do you have at home? I said, I got a mother-in-law that's really you know, driving me up a wall. He said, you've got to get out of there. Your nerves are very bad. So he gave me medication, and <laughs> luckily uh, the situation was relieved, or they would have had to put a bag on the side if it hadn't opened, you know. That's how bad my nerves were when I come back. I was an apprentice bricklayer, I was very nervous on a job, and I thought about suicide, jumping off of buildings. I didn't feel like I belonged in this country. And uh, you were an, an alcoholic at the yeah, time? Oh, yeah. Yes. And, you know, drinking more and more. Uh, finished the apprenticeship, moved out from the mother-in-law, and we got our own home under a GI Bill, and then we had two children. But uh, there was periods of drinking and periods where I kicked my own front door in when the wife wouldn't let me in the house. And then you get... Uh, were I needed help. Then you... Gotten into a life of so-called crime. Well, first she left me, you see, and I wound up totally broken down in a veterans mental hospital. And uh, I didn't know then, but they kept me there 30 days. It was a 1950. That was the delayed stress. I completely fell apart. You see, I never took any of this 26, 26 unemployment for 26. I went right back to work. See, I didn't know then, but I know now. I was diagnosed with manic depressive finally in 1978 by a VA doctor. I should have been diagnosed there. But it's ironical. I'm jumping around because it's very important. i got to do it this way. Yeah, quick. I know. It's a complex story. In 1976, when I joined a veteran's organization, a service officer asked me to send for my record from that hospital. And I talked about the psychiatrist talking about mood swings and so forth. But he said, you can do no more for this, for this uh, veteran. And I was discharged. And guess who signed that discharge? It was a Jewish doctor. And you know, and obviously it come directly from the front, huh? I don't know where front it comes lines. from. But he, uh, he, he discharged me, yeah. and the service officer of this veterans organization should, uh, said I should have had at least a year's inpatient treatment. That's how sick I was. Well, this is a point we like to, we want to get into, too, because uh, I get so many complaints from men and veterans who are in these uh, veterans hospitals of the shabby treatment. And, you know, the American people, even now, they're... They're beginning to say, oh, these Vietnam guys, they were great and all that, and the Korean fellows were great and like that. But really, do they put their money where their mouth is? How many of them really go into these veterans' hospitals and support the veterans in those hospitals? Tom, I've and, seen... And what about the money that's supposed to be going into the veterans' uh, rehabilitation and so forth? It seems to be minuscule compared to the problems they have. From what I've seen, I believe in my heart there's a total conspiracy against the veterans. They don't give a damn whether you get in there or not. I know of one situation up right out here in Los Angeles, California, where a security guard, when we had a 1980 demonstration, when this veteran went through the door with a Jeep, a security guard told me he's seen approximately 2,000 veterans, Korean War and Vietnam and World War II, turned away from psychiatric treatment. Denied entrance into the hospital. Uh, I hate to be cold about it, but don't you th don't you think that uh, a, a, a vast majority of American people are hypocrites? They say, uh, "Oh yeah, go to war, go to war, go to war," and then you pay the price and you come back, and uh, they give you lip service, but they really don't care. That's right. Yeah, you know, war is a racket. General Sm General Smedley Butler, three-time winner of the Medal of Honor, wrote that book years ago. That war is a racket. All it was was to make money, for the Zog to make money, you know. I knew uh, friends of mine who were in Korea, and they told me one thing that they always knew when a, when an artillery 
uh, attack was coming, there was a big shell uh, oil emplacement not too far from them. And they said that's where they'd run and stay in there till the shelling got through because the communists never shelled one of those big oil dumps of Shell Oil Company and those companies like that. So that really shows us what we're really talking about. Well, see, they didn't fight that to stop communism. Do you believe they did? Oh, no, absolutely not. That war was put on through the United Nations. You know, by the way, the Rockefellers donated the land that the United Nations was built on. My God. Uh, there was no uh, old derricks, nothing like it around where I was. I was right up near the MLR, main line of resistance, right next hill next to it, and supporting the Turks. And we had the Turks with us and a bunch of real hardened troops. The Turks were really tough. And uh, there was nothing but, you know, bunkers and one-man tents, uh, white tents to so that the chinks couldn't find us, you know, resemble the snow around us, you know. Yeah. We'd stay in these one-man tents, two men in a one-man tent. But, uh, you know, it's ironical, you talk about these old derricks and all. When I was in Korea, Eisenhower came, General Eisenhower came over there. The snow was all over the ground. They got a picture of it down at Patriotic Hall in Los Angeles, California. He's standing up in a jeep, and I thought, that as a young soldier, 22, this is great, this big famous general being over here. The sun was shining. It snowed like Dickens the day before. And there's Ike waving to everybody. <laughs> but it's ironical. Not one round of artillery came in that day. Hmm. I didn't know why then. There was no truce, but I know why now. The Birch Society's got a book out on Eisner called The Politician. You vets and people out there ought to read it. You know, also, and I know we maybe have some disagreement on this, but if you go back, to Coxey's army when thousands of uh, veterans uh, after World War I marched on Washington demanding their bonus, which they were promised, and they set up that camp uh, across from the White House. Uh, it was Douglas MacArthur and his boys that rode in there and destroyed the camp and ran them out. And so uh, maybe he rehabilitated in a lot of areas after that, but I can never forgive MacArthur for doing that. Well, Tom, I had got a hold of some information that many of those so-called veterans that were on that march were actually Marxists. Well, but I think that, that may, you, there may have been Marxists uh, among thousands of men demanding a bonus. But even if there were some Marxists, it doesn't make it right what the government did. Well, I mean, what I read, there were more Marxists than actual veterans there on the location. I have a feeling that that was conservative uh, propaganda myself. But anyhow, oh, we'll no. go on from there. Maybe we got a little difference of opinion. Well, here. I think the world, General MacArthur, because he actually won the war in 1950. You know, I've got a little thing here I'd like to... But why, when he came back to the United States, why didn't he expose, uh, why didn't he fight? I remember I was expecting him to come back with his sleeves rolled up and, 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 and fight. But he went to the Congress. I watched it on television. He gave his farewell address and just faded away, like he said in the speech, mm -hmm. and left the road open uh, for Eisenhower and so forth uh, to take over. Well, I believe that MacArthur eventually discovered how big the, tre the treachery and the treason was in this country. Here's an example an excerpt from his book called Reminiscences, which anyone can find in a library if you can find the copies are scarce. But the title of the book is Reminiscences by General Douglas MacArthur. And this is a little booklet here, The United Nations Today by Robert W. Lee, which I once got from American Opinion Bookstore, the Birth Society. This is a quote from General Douglas MacArthur. I was worried by a series of directives from Washington, which were greatly decreasing the potential of my Air Force. First, I was Bidden hot pursuit of enemy planes that attacked our own Manchuria and Siberia, sanctuaries of inviolate protection for all enemy forces and for all enemy purposes, no matter what depredations or assaults might come from there. Then I was denied the right to bomb the hydroelectric plants along the Yalu. The order was broadened to include every plant in North Korea which was capable of furnishing electric power to Manchuria and Siberia. Most incomprehensible of all was the refusal to let me bomb the important supply center at Racine, which was not in Manchuria or Siberia, but many miles from the border in northeast Korea. Racine was a depot to which the Soviet Union forwarded supplies from Vladivostok for the North Korean army.